Wilson's assistant counts for a good deal in this mystery of the Red-Headed League. I am sure that you inquired your way merely in order that you might see him. Not him. What then? The knees of his trousers. And what did you see? What I expected to see. Why did you beat the pavement? My dear doctor, this is a time for observation, not for talk. We are spies in an enemy's country. We know something of saxe coburg Square. Let us now explore the parts which lie behind it. The road in which we found ourselves, as we turned round the corner from the retired saxe coburg Square, presented as a great contrast to it as the front of a picture does to the back. It was one of the main arteries which conveyed traffic of the city to the north and west. The roadway was blocked with the immense stream of commerce flowing in double tide inwards and outwards, while the footpaths were black with the hurrying swarm of pedestrians. It was difficult to realise as we looked at the line of fine shops and stately business premises that really abutted on the other side upon the faded and stagnant square which we had just quitted. Let me see, said Holmes, standing at the corner and glancing along the line. I should like to just remember the order of the houses here. It is a hobby of mine to have an exact knowledge of London. There is Mortimer's, the tobacconist's, the little newspaper shop, the Coburg branch of the city and suburb bank, the vegetarian restaurant, and McFarlane's carriage building depot. That carries us right on to the other block. And now, Doctor, we've done our work. So it's time we had some play. A sandwich, a cup of coffee, then off to violin land, where all is sweetness and delicacy and harmony, and there are no red-headed clients to vex us with their conundrums. My friend was an enthusiastic musician, being himself not only a very capable performer, but a composer of no ordinary merit. All the afternoon he sat in the stalls, wrapped in the most perfect happiness, gently waving his long, thin fingers in time to the music while his gently smiling face and his languid, dreamy eyes were as unlike those of Holmes the sleuth-hound, Holmes the relentless, keen-witted, red-handed criminal agent, as it was possible to conceive. In his singular character, the dual nature alternately asserted itself, and his extreme exactness and astuteness represented, as I have often thought, the reaction against the poetic and contemplative mood which occasionally predominated in him. The swing of his nature took him from extreme languor to devouring energy, and as I knew him well, he was never so formidable, truly formidable as when, for days on end, he had been lounging in his armchair amid his improvisations and his black letter editions. Then it was that the lust of the chase would suddenly come upon him, and that his brilliant reasoning power would rise to the level of intuition, until those who were unacquainted with his methods would look askance at him as an um, on a man whose knowledge was not that of other mortals. When I saw him that afternoon so enwrapped in the music at St. James's Hall, I felt that an evil time might be coming upon those whom he had set himself to hunt down. You want to go home, no doubt, Doctor, he remarked as we emerged. Yes, it would be as well. And I have some business to do which will take some hours. This business at Coburg Square is serious. Why serious? A considerable crime is in contemplation. I have every reason to believe that we shall be in time to stop it, but today being Saturday rather complicates matters. I shall want your help tonight. At what time? Ten will be an early enough. I shall be at Baker Street at ten. Very well. And I say, Doctor, there may be some little danger, so kindly put your army revolver in your pocket. He waved his hand, turned on his heel, and disappeared in an instant among the crowd. I trust that I am not more dense than my neighbours, but I was always oppressed with a sense of my own stupidity in my dealings with Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Here I had learned, heard what he had heard, I had seen what he had seen, and yet from his words it was evident that he clearly saw not only what had happened, but what was about to happen, while to me the whole business was still confused and grotesque. As I drove home to my house in Kensington, I thought over it all from the extraordinary story of the red-headed copier of the encyclopedia down to the visit to Saxe-Coburg Square and the ominous words with which he had parted from me. What was this nocturnal expedition? And why should I go armed? Where will we be going? And what were we to do? I had the hint from Holmes that the smooth-faced pawnbroker's assistant was a formidable man, a man who might play a deep game. 
I tried to puzzle it out, but gave up in despair, and set the matter aside until night should bring an explanation. It was a quarter past nine when I started from home and made my way across the park, and so through Oxford Street to Baker Street. Two hansoms were standing at the door. As I entered the passage, I heard the sound of voices from above. On entering his room, I found Holmes in animated conversation with two men, one of whom I recognised as Peter Jones, the official police agent, while the other was a long, thin, sad-faced man with a very shiny hat and an oppressively respectable frock coat. Ha! Our party is complete, said Holmes, buttoning up his pea jacket and taking his heavy hunting crop from the rack. Watson, I think you know Mr. Jones of Scotland Yard? Let me introduce you to Mr. Merriweather, who is to be our companion in tonight's adventure. We're hunting a couples again, Doctor, you see, said Jones, in his consequential way. Our friend here is a wonderful man for starting a chase. All he wants is an old dog to help him to do the running down. I hope a wild goose may not prove to be the end of our chase, observed Mr. Merriweather gloomily. You may place considerable confidence in Mr. Holmes, sir, said the police agent loftily. He has his own little methods, which, if you won't mind me saying so, just a little too theoretical and fantastic, but he has the makings of a detective in him. It is not too much to say that once or twice, as in that business of the Sholto murder and the Agra treasure, he has been more than nearly correct than the official police force. Oh, if you say so, Mr. Jones, it is all right, said the stranger with deference. Still, I must confess that I miss my rubber. It is the first Saturday night for seven and twenty years that I have not had my rubber. I think you will find, said Sherlock Holmes, that you will play for a higher stake tonight than you have ever done yet, and that the play will be more exciting for you, Mr. Merriweather. The stake will be some thirty thousand pounds, and for you, Jones, it will be the man upon whom you wish to lay your hands. John Clay, the murderer, thief, smasher, and forger. He's a young man, Mr. Merriweather, but he is at the head of his profession, and I would rather have my bracelets on him than any criminal in London. He's a remarkable man, is young John Clay. His grandfather was a royal duke, and he himself has been to Eton and Oxford. His brain is as cunning as his fingers, and though we meet signs of him at every turn, we never know where to find the man himself. He'll crack a crib in Scotland in one week, and be raising money to build an orphanage in Cornwall the next. I've been on his track for years, and have never set eyes on him. I hope that I may have the pleasure of introducing you tonight. I've had one or two little turns, also Mr. John Clay, and I agree with you that he is at the head of his profession. It is past ten, however and quite time that we started. If you two will take the first handsome, Watson and I will follow in the second. Sherlock Holmes was not very communicative during the long drive, and lay back in the cab humming the tunes which he had heard in the afternoon. We rattled through an endless labyrinth of gasted streets until we emerged into Farringdon Street. We are close there now, my friend remarked. This fellow, Merriweather, is a bank director, and personally interested in the matter. I thought it as well to have Jones with us also. He is not a bad fellow, though an absolute imbecile in his profession. He has one positive virtue. He is as brave as a bulldog, and as tenacious as a lobster. If he gets his claws upon anyone, here we are, and they are waiting for us. We had reached the same crowded through fair in which we had found ourselves in the morning. Our cabs were dismissed, and following the guidance of Mr. Merriweather, we were passed down a very narrow passage, and through a side door which he had opened for us. Within there was a small corridor which ended in a very massive iron gate. This also was opened, and led down a flight of winding stone steps, which terminated at another formidable gate. Mr. Merriweather stopped to light a lantern, then conducted us down a dark, earth-smelling passage, and so after opening a third door into a huge vault or cellar, which was piled all round with crates and boxes. You are not very vulnerable from above, Holmes remarked, as he held up the lantern and gazed about him. Nor from below, said Mr. Merriweather, striking his stick upon the flags which lined the floor. Why, dear me, it sounds quite hollow, he remarked, looking up in surprise. I must really ask you to be a little more quiet, said Holmes severely. You have already imperiled the whole success of our expedition. Might I beg that you would have the goodness to sit upon? one of his boxes, and not to interfere. The solemn Mr. Merriweather 
perched himself upon a crate, and with a very injured expression upon his face, while Holmes fell upon his knees upon the floor, and with the lantern and the magnifying lens, began to examine minutely the cracks between the stones. A few seconds sufficed to satisfy him, for he sprang to his feet again and put the glass in his pocket. We have at least an hour before us, he remarked, for they can hardly take any steps until the good pawnbroker is safely in bed. Then they will not use a minute. But the sooner they do the work, the longer time they will have for their escape. We are at present, Doctor, as you have no doubt divined, in the cellar of the city branch of one of the principal London banks. Mr. Merriweather is the chairman of directors, and he will explain to you that there are reasons why the most daring criminals of London should take a considerable interest in the cellar at present. It is our French gold, whispered the director. We have had several warnings that an attempt might be made. Your French gold? Yes. We had occasion some months ago to strengthen our resources, and borrowed, for that purpose, 30,000 Napoleons from the Bank of France. It has become known that we have never had occasion to unpack the money, and that it is still lying in our cellar. The crate upon which I sit contains 2,000 Napoleons, packed between layers of lead foil. Our reserve of bullion is much larger at present than is usually kept in a single branch office, and the directors have had misgivings upon the subject, which were very well justified, observed Holmes. And now it is time that we arranged our little plans. I expect that within an hour matters will come to a head. In the meantime, Mr. Merriweather, we must put the screen over that dark lantern. Had sit in the dock? I'm afraid so. I had brought a pack of cards in my pocket, and I thought... As you were a bird party, Curry, you might have your rubber after all. But I see that the enemy's preparations have gone so far that we cannot risk the presence of the light. And first of all, we must choose our positions. These are daring men, and though we shall take them at a disadvantage, they may do us some harm, unless we are careful. I shall stand behind this crate, and do your conceal yourselves behind those. Then, when I flash a light upon them, close in swiftly. If they fire, Watson, have no compunction about shooting them down. I place my revolver cocked upon the top of a wooden case behind which I crouched. Holmes shot the slide across the front of his lantern and left us in pitch darkness, such absolute darkness as I never before experienced. The smell of hot metal remained to assure us that the light was still there, ready to flash out at a moment's notice. To me, when my nerves worked up to a pitch of expectancy, there was something depressing and subduing in the sudden gloom and in the cold, dank air of the vault. They have but one retreat, whispered Holmes. That is the back for the house into Saxe-Coburg Square. I hope that you have done what I asked you, Jones. I have an inspector and two officers waiting at the front door. They will have stopped all the holes. And now we must be silent and wait. What a time, it seemed. From comparing notes afterwards, it was but an hour and a quarter Yet it appeared to me that the night must have almost gone, and the dawn be breaking above us. My limbs were weary and stiff, for I feared to change my position, yet my nerves were worked up to the highest pitch of tension, and my hearing was so acute that I could not only hear the gentle breathing of my companions, but I could distinguish the deep, heavy, and breath of the bulky Jones from the thin, sighing note of the bank director. From my position I could look over the case in the general direction of the floor. Suddenly, my eyes caught glint of a light. At first, it was but a lurid spark upon the stone pavement. Then it lengthened out, until it became a yellow line. Then, without any warning or sound, a gash seemed to open, and a hand appeared. A white, almost womanly hand, which felt about in the centre of the little area of light. For a minute or more, the hand, with its writhing fingers, protruded out of the floor. Then it was withdrawn as suddenly as it appeared. And all was dark again, save the single lurid spark which marked a chink between the stones. Its disappearance, however, was momentary. With a rendering, tearing sound, one of the broad white stones turned over upon its side and left a square gaping hole through which the stream the light of a lantern. Over the edge there peeped a clean-cut boyish face which looked keenly about it, and then, with a hand, 
on the other side of the aperture, drew 